Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be joining us from. Um, welcome to CG seminar number 234, uh, which has been jointly organized today by CG and also by CIG, which is the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. Uh, my name is Rebecca Schendel. I'm the managing director of CIG, and I'll be um, sharing the chairing of today's Simon, uh, excuse me, today's session with Simon. So the idea for today's session came about when we were discussing the, the recent events of unfolding in Afghanistan and specifically the tragic circumstances in which so many former partners and colleagues at universities which had received aid and other forms of support from uh, quote unquote Western partners, including universities, uh, found themselves and continue to find themselves. Um, we wanted to do something to address uh, the crisis, but we also wanted the conversation to be a productive one um, that might go some way towards avoiding similarly tragic circumstances in future. So we settled on the idea of highlighting higher education reform efforts in so-called unstable states. So our aim today with this session is to discuss whether and under what circumstances foreign contributions to higher education in such contexts can ever be successful. And given today's lineup of speakers, I have no doubt that this aim will be achieved, um, and then some. So today we will be hearing from Gretchen Rossman, who's Professor of International Education at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, a short drive from us here at BC, um, and Anthony Welch, Professor of Education at the University of Sydney in Australia, so not at all a short drive from us here at BC. Um, so both Gretchen and Tony will be bringing both their scholarly, scholarly perspectives on this issue and also their personal and professional experiences to bear on today's topic, um, which as a reminder is supporting higher education in unstable states, can foreign contributions ever deliver? And that's because both Gretchen and Tony have a long history of involvement with higher education systems around the world, including in contexts such as Afghanistan, Myanmar, and other so-called uh, fragile or unstable states. But before I hand over to Gretchen and Tony, there are just some brief housekeeping points which I need to mention. This will not be new to many of you if you attend, have attended other CG webinars, but as a reminder, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CG website in due course. A transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted, so do be aware that all messages broadcast to the full participant list will be made public after the event. We also remind you to please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, although please do so when you're asking a question. We recommend throughout the webinar that you use the speaker view um, so that you can more clearly see who is talking. And if you're interested in asking a question, please use the chat function and write out the question you wish to ask. There's no need to wait until the end of the speaker's presentation to do so. You can ask questions at any point in the chat function. And at the end of the presentation, if your question is selected, you'll be invited by Simon to ask it yourself directly. So that means if you're invited to ask a question, we ask that you unmute yourself, switch on your video, say, state your name and where you're from, and then ask your question. So without further ado, I will now pass over to Gretchen and Tony for today's seminar. Thank you very much, Rebecca, um, and particular special thanks to Gerardo Blanco for inviting me to participate in this event. So um, the purpose of my brief remarks are to raise some ethical considerations for us to ponder as we discuss if and how contributions from the global north can help when working with colleagues in conflict and crisis affected states. But note that the, the considerations that I'll mention are drawn from the moral and ethical canon of the global north and are therefore perhaps problematic. And also note that my remarks focus on donor driven projects, which has been my experience rather than on collaborative research that you might do with colleagues in a quote unquote fragile state. So um, in terms of the ethical considerations, I would argue that those working in international higher edu education development encounter, that we encounter ethics in every decision we make, every action we take. Moral principles, what you consider good or bad, right or wrong, define your ethics and your character, which guides your actions. Thus, ethics concerns itself with conduct in specific situations. What is the right way to act? when you are called upon to make decisions and take action that has consequences for yourself, those you engage with, the project you're working on, and perhaps the future of such work. So again, given the Western canon, the Northern canon, ethical theories can be grouped into two broad categories, consequentialist and non-consequentialist ethical, ethical theories. So consequentialist, Ethical theories focus on outcomes, 
This position argues that an, an action is not intrinsically good or bad. It is good or bad because of its results in a particular context. This is frequently illustrated by the notion of utilitarianism, that actions are right if they are useful or for the benefit of the majority. The question immediately arises, who determines that? Non-consequentialist ethical theories tend to recognize universal standards to guide action. And again, I would note the use of the term universal from these perspectives. I think that that too is problematic. Mm. That, and the whole notion of universal standards is itself disputed. But included here are the ethic of individual rights and responsibilities and the ethic of justice. <clears throat> The ethic of individual rights and responsibilities upholds the unconditional worth of and equal respect to which all human beings are entitled and the, and the corresponding obligations or responsibilities that individuals have to protect those rights. The ethic of justice, in contrast, espouses the redistribution of resources and opportunities to achieve equity above equality, especially in circumstances of economic and social disadvantage. Thus, the welfare of the least advantaged should drive any decision or action. Another non-consequentialist theory is the ethic of care, which is one that I particularly resonate with. It emphasizes that concrete, circum it emphasizes concrete circumstances over abstract principles. It emphasizes the moral interdependence of people. Espoused particularly by Nell Noddings, she wrote, quote, our goodness and our growth are inextricably bound to that of others that we encounter. Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. And one must meet the other in caring. From this requirement, there is no escape for one who would be moral. So as the brief summary of this se session described, um, the, the first order question is whether we engage with colleagues in in uh, conflict and crisis affected situations, whether we do it or not. So much of international aid is grounded in principles of conditionality and control. The recipient of such aid must accept the conditions. For example, proper distribution of funds, no corruption, as well as the control that the donor agency exercises <clears throat> over implementation and continued funding. We all most likely have colleagues or know of colleagues who would answer a resounding no to this question, arguing that any engagement exacerbates an imperialistic approach to higher education development, given the power differentials between the Global North institutions and the recipients of such aid. <clears throat> they might argue the Global North has the answers and the solutions. We are bringing these to you, the other, for your benefit. Much international higher education aid stipu stipulates that targeted institutions will be reformed <clears throat> or capacity will be developed. What constitutes reform or capacity development is of course determined initially by the funding agency. However, the precise nature of the reform or development would have been ideally negotiated with recipient government and institutions. This, however, does not always happen, as I will provide an example. We first, we, myself and colleagues at the Center for International Education at UMass, had a long-term collaboration with the University of Malawi, particularly their flagship campus, Chancellor College. When we first arrived to begin this work, uh, a senior Oxford educated, Oxford educated professor said to me, quote, you are the ones doing capacity building and we are the ones to be capacity built. He and others had not heard of this project until our team arrived on campus. Funded by USAID, the project had not been negotiated with senior faculty members or even senior officials in the ministry. So again, related, I believe that I would argue that a first order ethical question is who gets to define what is reform? Who gets to define what is capacity? 
and who gets to define development and development towards what? So I pose the question to this, what is your ethical stance? Should we engage or not? Or is your answer more nuanced? And if it is more nuanced, does it depend on how we work with others? So to me then the second order question is, if we say yes, we choose to engage, the question becomes how we do this. And again, I refer back here to the notion of the ethic of care, um, because my view is that higher education international development can be viewed as a process of interpersonal relationship building and mutual learning mm. that focuses on how we ethically engage with our counterparts, especially in conflict affected or fragile states. This in turn, of course, prompts the question of whether we should consider a set of principles of ethical practice for higher education, for those working in higher education international development. Many organizations have such codes of practice, but the question remains, are those followed in the micro interactions that we have with our colleague counterparts? So the ethical considerations that arise in working with colleagues in fragile states can be viewed as a complex mix of sometimes competing obligations. We have obligations to donor agencies if we're working on funded projects. We may have obligations to our own country. We may feel obligations to the countries that we are working with. We have obligations to ourselves, to our profession, to our colleagues, to our counterparts. I would argue that these are thorny issues. They're not simple and they're not simply resolved. But I wanna move into a series of questions that I pose for all the participants to think about um, as we continue this discussion. So, to me, a clear ethical issue is, do international, those working in international higher education uh, development, how do they justify their expatriate lifestyles? What personal ethical dilemmas and conflicts arise when you confront um, those lifestyles in the context of a fragile state? A second question related is how do you ethically think through the considerable income differences between yourselves and those you're trying to serve? The considerable racial and ethnic differences, the considerable religious differences. How do you reason through that and take an ethical position? Another question is to ponder what constitutes corruption? across all settings, is it ethically wrong? Or is it a way of doing business? Who decides? Who gets to make the ethical stance on that? A another question is, when you're working in international higher education, what are the risks to health, the health and welfare that you yourselves face? And how do you deal with those? Perhaps more important for this webinar is what are the risks to quote recipients of that aid and how are these taken into account? I'm gonna digress for um, a moment with an example <laughs> from my center's work in Afghanistan. Um, the center first began working in Afghanistan in higher education in 2005. That work continues to today, although its future is obviously in um, question. Much of that work, and it was a series of contracts um, funded by USAID, much of that work focused on developing women into professional roles, working in these large scale projects in Afghanistan, the higher education sector. And it also focused on <clears throat> Um, bringing women into degree programs. So one part of the projects over time 
<clears throat> was to build master's degrees in education. And there was a stipulation that a certain number of women had to be enrolled in those degree programs. Those were all successful, but they are gone in an eye blink. Mm. So how do we understand that now? How do we look back and say, yes, the work made a difference, but it's gone. This is devastating. It's devastating for everyone who's been involved in that project. Um, so <clears throat> let me leave it with that. Let me leave my questions with, with that particular point about the work in Afghanistan and just give you a personal perspective. So my view on working internationally in conflict and crisis affected states is to think of it, again, using the ethic of care as a kind of ethical interpersonal engagement. So to me, that means a commitment to long-term engagement with the hope of building relationships grounded in mutual knowledge and trust. This takes time. And it also suggests that one-off, very short-term consultancies might well be considered problematic. A second thing that's part of my position is to engage with deep interpersonal respect for those you're working with, even when their ethical choices differ from your own. So it's trying to understand that and see where your colleagues are coming from and not judge it. And the final one is a deep commitment to learning about those you work with. Their complex, sometimes dangerous contexts, their hopes and fears, as well as learning more about yourself as an engaged collaborator. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gretchen. I think Tony, will we pass directly to you? Okay. Okay, can everyone hear me and see? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so, um, firstly, thank you to Simon and Rebecca for the invitation. Um, and um, I look forward to some interesting Q&A um, after this uh, presentation that I'll try and keep fairly brief. Um, the question here is how one can support higher education in unstable states, and in particular, problematizing the role of foreign contributions. Um, I'm going to try and illustrate some of the ethical dilemmas that Gretchen raised. Um, initially, by quickly um, sketching the different ways in which it can occur, so I've worked on higher ed in both Afghanistan and Myanmar, but in very different capacities. Um, the roles in Afghanistan emerged out of um, working with the ministry um, on strategic planning and so on. And that evolved into um, a brief project with AusAid, the Australian aid function uh, agency, looking at the role of private higher ed. Um, in turn, that involved working closely with um, both the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Higher Education, um, who were both very helpful, both in, in terms of supporting the project um, and helping with arrangements and so on. But I had considerable autonomy working with those um, ministries and, and taking advice from them. My role in Myanmar was very different. I was hired as a higher education expert and consultant by the ADB to work on, um, as part of a team, um, what's known as the Comprehensive Education Sector Review, um, the first one that had been conducted in 20 years. That had a much more tight format and um, methodology and so on. Um, so the forms were very, very different. Um, 
I, I think to take up the notion of unstable states momentarily too, um, I'd never anticipated that I would be working in those two very, very different systems. And as anyone would know, they are really very, very different. Yet three common points emerged out of uh, my work in those two systems. And um, each of them had implications in terms of ethical engagement. Um, the three common points were that each system, Afghanistan and Myanmar, were amongst the poorest um, um, systems on earth. That meant very limited capacity, including within the ministry, very incomplete data. Um, of the two major zones, each responsible for higher education, um, there was not even agreement on how many universities existed within the country. That's just one simple example, but it was widespread. Um, the second common point that is, if you look at um, data from Transparency International, you see that both systems are listed as amongst the most corrupt um, anywhere. Um, so, for example, in Afghanistan, the Ministry of Higher Education was very, very suspicious of private higher education institutions, which, although formally illegal at the time I was there, nonetheless existed. Um, and um, so that meant that they were very suspicious of those institutions. Um, they would say that the qualifications of many of the staff were not legitimate and, and so on. On the part of the private higher education institutions, they would point at interview to um, allegations of corruption within the ministry uh, in terms of, say, quality assurance and so on. Um, and the third common point is that each system, as we know, had major forms of ethnic and religious persecution. This made a difference in, in terms of very uh, directly in Myanmar, because although we were obviously, um, as part of our work, meant to visit sites, it became very clear that some sites were um, off the agenda. It was simply not possible to visit them. And indeed, uh, the main person who was uh, working in the office from the ministry, the office that we were working in, um, made it as difficult as possible to engage in any site visits at all, um, particularly to areas like Rakhine and, and Sitwe, for example, where, as we know, there are major forms of persecution. But, um, there were also some major barriers, um, in a sense, verging on corruption in some cases that were associated with the particular agencies who were involved. Um, as I indicated, I was working as part of a team for the ADB. We were told uh, it was fine to share our um, um, drafts and uh, so on with any of the other agencies. UNESCO, UNICEF, British Council, and so on, which we did. But there was no reciprocity, particularly from, as it happened, uh, the British Council, who was pressing us to um, provide our draft, but were entirely unwilling to share anything that they were doing. Um, so uh, there was this kind of competition, almost, between the various different agencies who were engaged, um, which was both very wasteful in terms of duplication of effort, um, but also in a sense, um, hardly ethical. Um, I became well acquainted, for example, with a, um, uh, a retired local um, consultant who was clearly working on some of this and we would talk from time to time. Um, we had planned to conduct some site visits together, um, but only at the very end in the last days of my 
work there did I find out that he was the principal UNESCO consultant working on higher ed. Um, so he was preparing a parallel report on higher education. Um, and it was something that, that was not shared at all. Um, so if there had been more cooperation, not only would it have been uh, better in terms of uh, quality and quantity of result, it's quite clear the whole would have been greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so there was a certain degree of um, dog in the manger attitude on the part of different agencies who were competing for influence. Um, and I think um, this was a major barrier to both um, the ethics of the project and the quality of what resulted. Um, and there was almost a certain degree of, I think, what could be called corruption or at least collusion on the part of some of those external agencies. For example, we were told in the case of Myanmar, not initially, but um, during the course of the project, that we could simply not mention anything to do with ethnicity. It was simply too sensitive. Um, and that was accepted. Um, but there's no doubt that it inhibited the content, the format and the tone of the report that we were able to write. Um, so there was a degree of, if not corruption, then at least collusion to some extent that raises some quite pertinent um, ethical issues. Um, so I think I, I've tried to um, pick up on some of the points that Gretchen raised in terms of ethical engagement by illustrating some of the practicalities of ethical engagement and how they affect the role of external individuals and external agencies. Perhaps I'll stop there and hopefully we can pick up on some of these in the Q&A. Well, thank you both for very um, interesting presentations which have really opened up a lot of questions and our Q&A is in the usual manner, slowly getting going, but I think once we start, we'll have quite a lot of participation and from this really impressive participant audience, we have about 102 people last time I looked. Um, so I think colleagues, um, uh, Gretchen and uh, Tony have given us real challenges. Um, and Gerardo is, uh, Blanco is gonna be our first uh, person to take up those challenges. Gerardo, come in please. Thank you. Well, thank you both, first of all, for sharing your thoughts and uh, truly thought uh, provoking. I, um, I was really intrigued. And, and of course, um, I, I, I think my question could really be addressed by both presenters, but not necessarily. I'm really intrigued by um, what appears to me, and you don't have to agree with, with this observation, what could be seen as different ethical frameworks in conflict with each other as we make sense of the current situation. I think in the last weeks, we have seen a lot of um, sort of coaching from the benches, right? A lot of commentary about just how evident some of the issues and consequences we are uh, observing uh, would have been. I think uh, the complexity um, that you both bring to this conversation is really, really valuable because it shows how difficult it is to make decisions when we have conflicts. I think um, one of these conflicts is, of course, the consequentialist view in retrospect now that says, well, of course, a lot of that work in Afghanistan um, uh, was problematic. I kind of want to bring a more nuanced perspective to the conversation. And I wonder if you both could go deeper in these of um, how we could potentially have a conflict between this consequentialist view with a, a perspective, an ethical perspective of justice, particularly of women who have been and now once again are excluded for most as from most aspects of public life in Afghanistan, including um, education and work. Uh, I'm sure you both uh, may have much more to, to say on this topic and we had limited time. So I really look forward to hearing uh, further thoughts on these. Gretchen, I think maybe you've got the first call on that. 
I'm sorry. Gretchen, I think perhaps oh, you might you respond to Gerardo first. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think that that's a really tricky question because I think that that there there are ethical frameworks that are that are in conflict with one another. Um, J'ai écouté mon séminaire. Là. Excuse me? No, no, no. I think that's unnecessary and unwelcome noise. <laughs> oh. we, we, we can continue on. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> so Jerry, I don't know how to go deeper than that other than to acknowledge that there are always going to be, um, we can take various perspectives, at least intellectually, and argue for their merit when applied to a particular situation. How we resolve those, um, I think, is, is really problematic. And now we then move forward. And what we think are the right things to do, even though we think this is the right thing to do, the right way to move forward, but then there's all this context that may be constraining those types of actions. I mean, I think about, again, what's happening in Afghanistan and the, um, the, the devastation that individual women and their families are experiencing, many of whom are well known to us. Um, and yet, what can be our role in this situation? So I'm shifting the conversation a little bit to the notion of how do you continue working in a state, and Myanmar certainly would fall into this category, where the government can be seen as um, evil, villainous, certainly oppressive. And can you continue to work in those kinds of situations? Um, you know, to improve the circumstances of those who have been um, left behind or negatively affected or so on. So I think, again, I'm trying to, uh, rather than deepen it, I'm, I'm trying to broaden it to say work, you have to, you are working in a context and part of that context is a nation state that may be deeply troubling to you if you're even allowed to continue to work there, right? Right. Um, Tony, Tony, did you want to comment as well? Yeah, I think um, I'd, I'd echo that. I think the, the importance of context is absolutely critical here. And again, <laughs> if, um, if I can pose a, a kind of practical dilemma, um, so, and, and it, relates specifically to the education of girls and women in Afghanistan. Um, I've had a PhD student who's been working on exactly this um, <laughs> until recently. He was uh, Deputy Minister of Education and he's now moving from house to house in Kabul, trying to keep himself and his family safe. Um, but his point in um, his work on um, extending educational opportunities for girls in Afghanistan was highly critical of many of the external agencies who were involved because he said, basically, they would come in with um, Western notions of uh, gender equality and so on and so forth. And in particular, in rural areas and villages and so on and so forth, that simply aroused opposition. His point was, if you want to be effective in extending opportunities for girls, what you need to do is to start with the Quran and the injunction that it is the responsibilities of families to educate their children, not to educate boys, to educate children. Um, and if you start with that ethical injunction, which is basic in the Quran, then he said you will get um, much greater acceptance, particularly in the more conservative rural areas outside of Kabul. So in a sense, again, this kind of situates that ethical dilemma and echoes Gretchen's point about the importance of context. 
Could I follow up on that, Simon? Because this is another example from Afghanistan. Um, when the Center for International Education first began working there, the project was not focused on higher education, but it was focused on literacy for women in very rural areas. And um, the way the project evolved was um, that the literacy training would focus on healthcare workers, on, on those who wanted to become health healthcare workers, particularly midwives. And so the strategy was to work with the imams and the um, the heads of family and so on to engage them in the idea that it would be my view okay for women to be trained to become midwives that that was considered appropriate meanwhile they were becoming literate you know so again it was negotiating within that context to figure right. out how to gain support from the powerful men um yeah can i bring in philip opec phil opec at this point phil Hi, Phil. Um, <clears throat> good morning, evening, night to everybody. Um, uh, <clears throat> my question is a kind of a follow up um, to the last uh, discussion, and that is, um, should we do it? I mean, that is, you know, decisions are, you know, you, you, you folks have made decisions, your institutions, yourself personally. Uh, to engage in this. And my question is, where's the line in the sand? I mean, and sh sh uh, so I, I guess it's two parts and I'm sorry for being a little bit incoherent. Um, in the context, where do you stop? And in the broader context, does this sort of work that so many well-intentioned uh, and maybe so not so well-intentioned governments uh, are trying to do uh, in these sort of conflict-prone countries. Where do you guys stand on this? Well, um, um, I mean, I do think Phil's raised an important point. And one of the things we haven't entirely discussed, of course, is the rationale for engagement by some of these external agencies. They're often funded by wealthy, powerful governments. Um, and although um, aid is an important part of the rationale, there are often signs that they are also angling for influence, um, angling for future contracts, um, both in education and in many other areas. So um, that is something I think that one that we should talk about and that is often not raised as, as part of the overall rationale for um, foreign intervention. Unless Gretchen wants to come in, to, uh, I'll move to... Go on, Gretchen. Yeah, I was just going to say briefly that um, that the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the center have over the years had the, just the kind of discussion that Tony articulates and that Phil question that Phil raised, and that is um, to put it quite bluntly, you know, yeah. the United States starts a war and then it comes in with aid, right? you know, that, that that can be seen as the pattern. And is it ethical to participate in that? And so many of the discussions that went on at the most senior levels of UMass had to do um, not so much with ethics, although that was touched on, but it had more to do with safety and lack of knowledge. So it was quite, it should not have been, but it was quite surprising that senior officials were terrified that faculty might be working in Afghanistan. They were just terrified. And it mostly had to do with the institutional risks 
mm. that they saw might be yep. incurred. Yep. I'd like to bring in uh, Glenn Chatelier at this point. Glenn. Hello, Glenn. We just had mail, so I know you're there. Are you battling to get in? Uh, okay. Can yes. you hear me at least? We can. I'm, I'm sorry. The uh, internet connection in Bangkok is pretty bad. There's been rain this evening. Okay. Um, I, I really enjoyed Gretchen's remarks this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. And of course, Tony was also very, very perceptive. Um, my question really has to uh, deal with uh, this question. If uh, you know, Gretchen would like to answer, and perhaps. Anthony as well, would psychological conditioning and intercultural ethics training be recommended for expatriate resource experts to offset the types of dissonance or shocks or in imbalanced decision making sometimes? What do you think? Would you like my cynical answer? <laughs> Let's my, just try that. <laughs> my, my cynical answer would be that um, I don't have a lot of confidence in training. Um, I have confidence in coaching and mentoring and on the ground experience that are informed by perhaps those with more experience or different perspectives or that kind of thing. Um, I think there's no question that many people who do international development work um, are rather nearsighted, would be a generous way to say it. Um, but they, my experience has been that they often come from um, but the belief that they are coming from a position of power and knowledge. Mm, mm. And little effort is given to um, understanding those that they want to work with. And I'm not sure that training can make a difference for that. I think mentoring and coaching, which is how I learned much of what I know, it was on the spot, in context, debriefing with colleagues, building trust with counterpart colleagues, being able to be open and honest with them about you know, what was working and what was not. So I, I'm sorry to be cynical, maybe it's just my age, I don't know. But Tony, what do you think? Well, um, I, 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 I agree, but in one sense, I think training is actually important and, I mean, I'm somewhat um, skeptical too, in the sense that when you often meet, for example, paradigmatically, um, so-called experts from the World Bank engaged in um, education projects, they're mostly PhD in economics, um, very little background in education, um, and mostly um, being schooled in a particular form of economics. So um, my experience is not always very, being very positive in terms of engagement with those individuals. Um, they get paid a lot of money. They come in with um, formulaic responses in many cases, pay rather little attention to the context that Gretchen's pointed to as being so critical. That's not, I, I don't want to tar them all with the same brush. There are some good people as well. But in one sense, the fact that they are often, you know, a PhD in economics from Chicago or somewhere like that um, doesn't actually attune them to the local context, quite the opposite. At this point, can I bring in Ruth? Ruth, hey-ho, good to see you in the webinar, Ruth. Hi, Hi Ruth. Thank you so much. And I have, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, good. I just want to say very deeply touched by these two cases, particularly Afghanistan and Myanmar. There's so much in our hearts right now. I don't have this kind of experience as my total experience is related to my work in China over about 50 years. But I thought, Gretchen, your point about 
long term. And when we say long term, are we thinking 10, 20 years? Or are we thinking 50 or 100 years? And some of these women educated, they may be in their terrible circumstances now, but 25 years from now, they may be the people that are able to bring in great strength. I watched what happened to the Chinese educated abroad in the Cultural Revolution. They were in prison. They went through horrors. What mm. did they do? They came back afterwards, both mm. after the Cultural Revolution and after the Tiananmen tragedy, to totally rebuild the country. Mm. And I was so impressed. Instead of saying we're going to pay back those who persecuted us and put us in prison, they said we're going to bring the knowledge over a long, long period of time to rebuild the country. I'm working on a translation project now about the Christian universities. More than 75 years ago, they were shut down as culturally imperialistic. And now scholars in China are writing about everything learned from them in the liberal arts, in other areas, in women's leadership. So when we talk about time, I think we don't need to, we shouldn't just talk about 10 years or 20. We need to think of much broader frame. And I hope it gives some kind of hope, although I know there's many uncertainties. Just thank you for giving me a chance to listen to your experience and share all the deep thoughts about how can it be mutual, integrated, and connected to the local. Thank you. Gretchen, do you want to respond to Ruth? You're muted. Um, Ruth, I really appreciate your long-term time perspective, um, and it is, it is heartwarming to hear the experiences of these women who had been so deeply hurt um, and yet rose to make a difference. I don't know what's going to happen in Afghanistan. I don't think anyone does. I do know that we are trying as hard as we can to help those who've been students with us or are current students with us or who worked with the projects and so on. Um, I don't know what will happen. I do know that, that the work in Malawi, particularly focused on women, um, after 20 years, it's been enormously successful in terms of the positions that women who took degrees with us or participated in various activities that were going on have risen to positions of, of influence. So, but that's not the same context as Afghanistan. I mean, I think, I think we cannot predict what's gonna happen there. Uh, but, but again, um, in terms of the ethics of engagement, which is what we're all about. I think it's been very telling to see the responses on the part of the range of countries that have been involved in Afghanistan and the failure of many of them. And I'll mention my own system, the Australian system in particular, the abject failure to support the number of Afghans who were working with and for, um, in the Australian case, our government to get out, even though they were desperate to get out. I know, Ruth, you may want to comment on this. I've seen reports that um, there's been criticism of the Canadian response to, and that played a role in the election, apparently, um, perhaps a minor one. But in general, the relative failure of many governments to respond adequately that has in fact placed many of those people that we're talking about, Afghan specialists in education at great risk and, and their families too. Colleagues, it's it's often, fundamental often happen, as often happens in webinars, people are now pouring into the chat and wanting to talk and um, you know, everyone's, everyone's got going if you like, but we've only got another 12 minutes or so. So what I'm going to do is bring in people in bunches now um, and we'll take three questions and ask our speakers to respond to them together. Um, do apologize for the compression and the, te the test of memory, but I think we want to bring as many voices as we can into the discussion. So we'll begin with a question from Zaini Asman, which I'm going to read out. 
and then we'll have Javed Musawi and we'll have Jack Lee. So Javed and Jack be ready and I'll find Zaini's question. Well, Zaini's got asked the big question that sort of we can never quite resolve, um, but it really is an important question, isn't it? Is there such a thing as universal standards of ethics? Do you think that there are also different ideals and understanding of ethical standards, even with us within a system or context? How do we handle that problem? Universal standards versus particularity. What Gretchen, do you want to start on that one? <laughs> so I get the tough one. Um, <laughs> I think that the whole notion of universal standards is problematic. Um, and yet also the notion of highly particularistic standards is problematic. I don't know the way through that. Um, I do know that again, drawing on my experience, I was confronted with a real challenge to um, the ethic of individual rights. Again, working with a PhD student in Malawi, part of what's encoded in, you all know this, but what's encoded in institutional review board ethical standards is the notion that a participant signs an informed consent form. The informed yeah. consent form stipulates that they're signing of their own free will. They can withdraw at any time. All those things that are fundamentally Northern, Western, mm. the mm. individual right. No sense about the, the responsibility to the collective, the responsibility mm. to the community. So this mm. PhD student of mine went into um, uh, fairly rural areas, again, working, gathering data from teachers and went to the teachers and shared this informed consent form. And they said, we don't have any individual right to agree or not to participate in this study because we are civil servants and whatever the ministry tells us to do, we must do. So that whole notion went out the window and I in fact invited him to write a critique of that mm -hmm. very Western notion of an individual right to participate in a research study. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not really addressing the question of whether there are universal standards, but um, I think it's I think it's tricky. Um, so I don't know, Tony, if you have something else to add. Well, I, I, I think, and Ruth may want to come in here too. I mean, there is certainly that difference between the more individualist approach of, of the North, if you like, and in many cases, a more communal communal or, or um, communitarian response by a number of cultures from the South. Um, but to pick up on the point about ethics committees, I mean, I think it's just a, a, a potent illustration of just what we're talking about. Um, my experience of ethics committees, and I've talked with lots of people from lots of different contexts about this, was university research ethics committees is it's very little to do with ethics and a great deal to do with risk management. So as long as they've got a paper trail that you know, ensures that the university is covered, um, then you know, the ethics is, is very much subordinate to that. I don't really think they have much to do with ethics at all, um, but it certainly makes the lives of our PhD students and indeed colleagues who engage in international research much, much more difficult. Yes, I think we've all got those stories. Um, now I'm going to do the bunching of questions. Um, Javed uh, Masawi, please, Javed. Hello, Javed. Hello, thank you so much for the opportunity. And it's always been a pleasure working with Professor Gretchen Rossman. And I've also had the privilege of reading uh, Tony's and Professor Blanco's uh, work. I come from Afghanistan and I currently am pursuing my PhD program at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Uh, I, I raised two questions in a sense to 
uh, reflect on Professor Gretchen's uh, issue with ethics. The reason I bring up donor coordination is because in my perspective, when universities uh, write proposal for funding, that is for a particular interest and for a particular time to be able to convince the funder, whoever, whoever they are, USAID, World Bank, or other governments, to provide them the funding. And when, in what ways can you uh, demonstrate or you know, put the ethics or long-term impact on the ground as looking at, for particularly looking at the performance indicators from USAID, at the end of the day, the expectation is number. There's limited uh, reflection on you know, what would happen to these people or what are the follow-up programs, unless there is uh, any. And the second part is about women's education. Uh, I grew up when the Taliban were in power in Kabul, and I remember the moments of humiliation in the torture and the hardship we had to go through, uh, let alone uh, you know, discussing the economic consequences that people were, you know, having such a difficult time. The country is moving backwards, like to that same tragedy that happened 20 years before, and it's, you know, uh, running backward. In your perspective, the, the way that I, I listen to their uh, news or to the way that they are uh, broadcasting is that they are following similar path as the Saudi Arabia. Is that something durable? Would that be something that people can live with? Or that depends, like I'm looking from, you know, Western perspective or more of developed world perspective. I know looking from the Afghan lens, that would be acceptable to many people, but would that satisfy women's right? Hold that uh, question in your minds, Gretchen and Tony. Jack Lee, please. I thank you both, uh, Gretchen and Tony, for an excellent talk. Um, I, I'll try to make this quick. Um, your discussion reminds me of two events uh, that had similar issues with higher education engagement. One is the 1989 Tiananmen Square in China. As you know, Ruth Hayhoe's in the room, she knows that very well. Um, you know, whether or not higher education should engage. The other one is recently, I was uh, listening to a debate between German politicians and the higher ed sector in Germany, whether or not Germany should be running universities in Jordan and Egypt, given the regimes that are in power. So I think sometimes we're sort of over persuaded by current events. And, you know, 20 years in Afghanistan, there are students in Afghanistan who've never seen a Taliban regime. So I, when I listen to you, I wonder, do you feel a personal sense of regret for participating? Or, you know, I, I myself used to work in Kazakhstan and I wonder at times, am I complicit in the problems I'm seeing? I mean, now I work in Scotland, but you know, it's a reflection of our personal engagement. Uh, perhaps I'm reading you incorrectly, but do you personally regret having been involved? Um, certainly from my um, perspective, I mean, this is, I think it's a, it's a tough question. Um, inevitably, there are no... I'm, I'm sorry, Tony, I, I have to take oh, more questions. Mohammed okay. um, is my next questioner. Mohammed, are you there? Rebecca, I'll call on you to come in, and if Muhammad can join us, we'll take him after you. There he is now. Muhammad, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Please ask your question. Uh, hello, thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask this question. Uh, my name is Muhammad Abdullahi. I am a PhD student in South, at Southwest University in China. So. The question I asked it was, uh, since we know 
that education is the key to the development of any society. So why we still the, why there is still a corruption in education despite the societies, every country, every society knows that the development of education can help to improve the society economically and politically and socially. So why there is still a corruption in education? And the another part of the question, what approaches can be used or followed to reduce uh, the corruption in education? Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Mohammed. Um, it's a good question. Uh, Rebecca, you, you've got the last question, then we'll take our a response from our two speakers and that'll close the webinar. Rebecca. Thank you, Simon. I, I guess I wanna come back to the title of the webinar, which is particularly looking at unstable states. I think some of these debates we've been having could apply for foreign aid in any context, but when we're particularly thinking about unstable states, I think what hasn't come up so much yet is the ethical position for aid or for involvement, because certainly the case is that we are, which you mentioned this, Tony, in your talk, when we're talking about places like Afghanistan and Myanmar, there are so little public funding or other funding available in those contexts that often it needs to come from the West for it to exist at all, either that's via, whether that's via academics, whether that's via aid programs. So you could argue that there's an ethical problem in not getting involved because then, you know, we in the West sort of sit on the, power that we have or the resources that we have without oh. distributing it. So Enough. I guess the question is how the, those ethical quandaries are resolved. So whether we should be involved at all, how that sits with the very real issues that Gretchen has brought up about imbalances within teams and or as Afghanistan has promoted, uh, has really highlighted what happens when people get targeted for their involvement with us. So I guess perhaps to end with something maybe more practical, what is it we can do to resolve no. some of those quandaries? Is it about how we form our teams? Is it about how we, is it about ensuring basic safety measures for our partners, if that's possible? Is it something about how we think about long-term engagement in unstable states where you can't necessarily assume that long-term support will continue? Well, colleagues, um, it's over to you to respond to those four rather different questions. And can I take them in, in, you in reverse order and take Tony first, and then we'll finish with Gretchen. Tony. Um, look, I'll pick up on what I, perhaps on, on one of these particularly, Simon, um, and that was the, the question posed by Mohammed. Um, if education is the key to development, he posed the question, so why do we have corruption? Um, I'll make this quick, but essentially, I think, Mohammed, the answer is that not everyone behaves in an ethical manner. There are so many different forms of corruption that operate in higher education, fake degrees, um, sexual harassment of, of staff, by, of, of um, young students, um, um, bribery, and, and there are so many forms. In part, this has been exacerbated and extended by the unregul often unregulated growth of private higher education institutions in many parts of the world, including in Afghanistan and now to some extent in Myanmar as well, um, where sometimes the motive is profit um, because education is seen as a business like any other, rather than involving in, if you like, the more public good side of things, um, which would mean that education is framed in a more ethical way. So I think the answer to your dilemma is we have corruption because individuals have different motives and some of them are not so pure. Gretchen. I'm going to do as Tony did and pick a couple of these to comment on. Um, I see a similarity between Jack's second point about German run universities in Jordan and it was one other country that was mentioned and his question Egypt. was, do we regret our involvement. And I think that relates to Rebecca's question about what are the ethics of not engaging. Okay, and um, 
I think that those are really complicated in the sense that do I personally regret my involvement? No. Um, do I see that it could have been different in certain ways? Yes. Sure. Um, to Rebecca's question, would I choose not to engage? My response to that has to be, it would depend. It would depend on what the nature of the work was. It would depend on who was funding it. It would depend on whether there was um, mutual negotiation about the terms of the work. It would depend on where the work was taking place and so on. And so I think all of those are kind of cascading considerations that go into um, engaging or not engaging. Um, let me just touch on the whole corruption notion. I find it interesting that we tend to focus on corruption from, again, from a Western perspective of what is what constitutes corruption, what is evil, what is what are bad actions to be taken taken in particular circumstances. <laughs> And I think we need to, Tony, you've done some of this, but we need to turn that lens on our own governments, our own agencies, our own actors in this scene. And Tony, you said it's not everyone from the World Bank who comes in with a three-piece suit in his briefcase, her briefcase. Um, but we need to ask, I think, what can we tolerate in terms of actions that we would can we me from the west would consider corrupt rather than the normative ways of going mm -hmm. about business that yeah. exist within a particular context mm -hmm. <laughs> that sensible note is a good one to end on uh and uh, i want to thank um gretchen and tony most sincerely i think that your, your thoughtful, nuanced contributions today were really, really helpful to all of us. And we got quite a good discussion going and we had many more people, I think, willing to come in. Uh, the chat itself is worth keeping, worth saving. It's got a lot of substance in it. Uh, these issues will not go away, obviously, and we'll pursue them, all of us, further in different ways, including in this webinar format. I want to thank um, Rebecca and Gerardo for setting up the webinar today. I think that it was timely and important after what's happened in Afghanistan that we talk about these issues. Um, and I'm pleased to invite everyone to come back to CG webinar format tomorrow at two o'clock UK time, where we're talking uh, about race, nativity and identity, engaging an equity driven approach to international research. Our speakers are Crystal George Moangi from George Mason University and Christina Yao from the University of South Carolina. So UK time, US panel and chaired by everyone's favorite CG person, Solomon Zualde, who's, uh, who's at the UCL in, in the UK. Uh, so look forward to seeing you again tomorrow for a continuation of our racism decoloniality series. But we um, thank, uh, again, thank Gretchen and Tony very much for helping us to think better about problems of uh, international development. Bye, bye to everyone for now, and look forward Thanks to everyone. you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Simon and Rebecca. Thank you.